This will change your life. I'm sure you have heard that before. Uh, it may be a new diet, keto, Atkins, paleo, vegan, intermittent fasting. This will change your life. It may be a new workout, the 12, 330, the thigh master, the ab roller, CrossFit. If you're a burn bro, then, I mean, it may, it may even be a habit, right? Clear your inbox every morning. Uh, have a date night once a week with your wife and, or husband. Uh, don't sleep next to your phone, uh, next to your bed. Sit in silence for 30 minutes every day. Uh, the implication, this will change your life, uh, is that your life needs to change, and that it needs to change for the better. Uh, when something makes an impact in someone's life, they become natural evangelists uh, to the thing that has helped them. So if your life was changed by keto, you're going to boast in keto. If your life was changed by removing gluten from your, your diet, you will boast in removing gluten. When something changes your life, you boast in it. We boast in what has changed us. We want to see results. We want to see an, a difference. And beloved, I want this for you. Uh, every sermon I, I preach, I, I want it to make an impact. I, I want you to either change something in your life, uh, your behavior, some thought pattern, how you view yourself or treat others, maybe a misunderstanding of who God is or what he has done for you, maybe some theological correction. Or, or uh, I may just want you to continue believing in and trusting in what you've already believed in God's word. But either way, I, I want the regular gathering of the saints here and the regular hearing and preaching of God's word uh, to change your life and to change it for the better. I want the word to impact your life. Ideas have consequences. What we believe should impact how we live. It should make a, a difference. Since Romans began, Paul has been teaching how all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ. No one is justified by works of the law, but we are justified by faith in Christ. If we believe that, it should impact our daily lives. But how? How does or how should the doctrine of justification by faith impact our lives? Lord willing, we'll spend the next few moments answering that very question. I believe there's three implications or three impacts we see here in the passage. Now, the first, justification by faith excludes human boasting for everyone, excludes human boasting for everyone. Paul makes a, makes a change in Romans 3.21. Uh, he turns from teaching on the wrath of God revealed from heaven against the unrighteousness of men to how one can be made righteous or how God declares one righteous in Christ. Look at verse 22. He says, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe, for there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. We are all sinners and are only made right by God by faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Salvation in and through in, in, is through faith in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus was put forward as a to pay the penalty of sin by absorbing the wrath of God on the cross. He took God's anger against us and he turned it to favor. Now, if you are in Christ and have accepted his work on the cross and believe in his resurrection from the dead, then by faith, God has declared you not guilty. You are free from condemnation. You have been made righteous through faith. You know, Paul will continue to make the case uh, justification by faith throughout the, re the next several chapters. But before he does, he offers this short paragraph before giving us three, three implications of this doctrine. 
As I said before, the first implication, justification by faith, excludes human boasting. Look at our text this morning in verse 27 and 28. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. So if justification by faith is true, human beings cannot boast in any of their work. It eliminates all human pride in their salvation. If salvation is by faith and not our works, then God gets all the glory. We bring nothing to salvation except the sin that made it necessary. Now, now Paul here is using a play on words. A law here means rule or principle. So boasting is excluded. So he says, by what rule or what system of demands exclude boasting? Uh, by the rule or demands of works? No. But by the rule or demands of faith. Now, Paul is juxtaposing faith and works, placing them side by side to, to contrast them with one another. Uh, author and scholar Douglas Moo writes, Paul uses use of of law or nomos uh, embodies a play on words in which the characteristic demand of the Mosaic law works is contrasted with the basic demand of the new covenant faith. Uh, Another scholar notes the law of works is the Mosaic law with its requirement of engaging in certain activities in order to receive life. The law of faith is the gospel's requirement of reliance for deliverance from sin on the gracious activity of God who has freely reconciled his people to himself in the atoning death of Christ. Now we see a very clear distinction. Paul makes this point clear in verse 28. For we hold that no one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Uh, When Martin Luther was translating uh, this verse from the Greek into uh, to common German. Uh, He added one simple word that's not in the Greek text, but makes a key uh, understanding, making the text understanding uh, simple. He says, for we hold that one is justified by faith alone, apart from the works of the law. That became the rallying cry of the Reformation, sola fide, faith alone. We know the doctrine, but does it impact our daily lives? So Jews in Paul's day had a, had a synergism of, of works and faith. Uh, for some believed in faith, but also believed in their works contributing to their salvation. So when Paul uses the word excluded here, he, he uses it like a very graphic word picture of the slamming of a door, kind of completely slamming the door shut. He slams the door on human boasting. Uh, Thomas Schreiner writes, People can confess God's grace, deeply believe in it, and yet believe that human works play a vital role in obtaining salvation. Have we slammed the door on our own boasting? Has the doctrine of justification by faith impacted how or what you boast in? Let me kind of press in with maybe a few questions. I think a lot of times in our own life is that we we claim a certain doctrine, justification by faith. We rejoice in it. We're happy to preach it. But in our actual lives, the door is not fully shut. It's just kind of cracked open. And we're leaving room for for maybe subtle boasting in our own heart. So let me ask you a few questions. You can diagnose your own boasting. Do you compare your works to others? When we compare ourselves and our works to others, rather than to God, we may be secretly boasting in our flesh. We may be more holy than someone or in some area of our lives, but but why do we care? We, We care because we want to boast about what we are doing in comparison to others. Now, this happens even in my own life. There's there's certain things that I think that I might do better than others. And and when I see other people not doing that thing, what rises up in my heart is this this subtle boast of how I am better than them in in this particular area. 
Well, in that moment, what the Lord is showing me is I have not slammed the door on human boasting, but there's a part of me that wants to rejoice in what I do in myself. God is holy. We are not. When we compare ourselves to him, we exclude all boasting. So are you comparing your holiness, your life to others or to God? Second question, do you, do you pray? Prayerlessness is a sign of self-sufficiency. When we do not pray, we are telling God we do not need him. We are acting in pride and depending upon ourselves. And any time we depend upon ourselves, we, are, we, are, we want to boast in our elf efforts. We do not, beloved, want to be self-sufficient. We want to be God-dependent. And our lack of prayer life may actually be revealing more than we want to admit. Next question, do you ask for help? One of the reasons why we do not ask people for, for help is that we don't want to look weak or in, in need. It's also a sign of pride. We want to boast in our ability to not need help, to be able to do things on our own. Yet asking for help aids in, in closing the door to our own human boasting. It, it reminds us of our need for help, even in small matters. If we are reminded in small matters of how we are in desperate need for others, what would that do for our, our, our thinking of even grander matters like our salvation with the Lord? Do you take a Sabbath? We may not rest because we think things depend upon us. We may believe that we are justified by faith, but functionally living out being justified by our works. When we cannot rest, when we cannot take a day off, when we cannot sit at a meal without looking at our phone, when we can't take a break from other things in our life to gaze at the person right in, in front of us, what we are showing is a sign of a lack of God dependency. We're thinking that we are far more needed than we actually are. We are trying to fight against our own humanity, of who are, how we were made as human beings who need rest. Sabbath helps us rest in our daily labors in this life, but it also helps us remind us of the rest that we have from our salvation. We no longer have to work for our salvation because it has been taken care of by Christ. It helps us understand that our salvation is justified, we are justified by faith. Next question. Do you have a hard time saying no? You may have a hard time saying no because you think your friendships or your family relationships are dependent upon your labor. You may think, if I don't do this thing for that person, they won't accept me. If you do that with others, that may be a sign that you're actually doing that with the Lord. If I don't do this thing, then maybe the Lord may not accept me. Do you have a hard time coming to God after you sin? You may intellectually know that God loves you, but, but if, you, if you don't think that you will be accepted after you sin, you may not fully understand the gospel. You may think that you have to clean yourself up first before he will accept you. If that's the case, friends, you have not shut the door on your boasting. There's a part of you that says, I have to do these things in order to be accepted by God. And Paul says here, slam the door. Slam the door on your human boasting. Justification by faith is a tremendous doctrine. It frees us from so many things. The human heart is one of pride. And any place you see pride bubbling up in your heart, you need to apply justification by faith. You need to allow this doctrine to affect and influence everything in your life. Friends, it is, it is freeing. It, it is so powerful when you fully, when you get it. It will change your life. You know, one verse I often repeat to myself in my, only, in my own life when I see pride bubbling up in me. And my pride bubbles up in Dave Keen all the time. I have to slay it. 1 Corinthians 4, 7. What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? Everything we have is our gift. Our intellect, our families, our height, our strength, our friends, everything is a gift from his hand. If it's true about those things, 
It is especially true of salvation. If we are saved by faith through the redemption of Jesus Christ, and because we are saved by faith alone, it should impact every aspect of our lives. So we have to do the hard work of slamming the door on our boasting. When pride is starting to bubble up, we have to see it, and we have to shut it down. First implication. Second implication from this text, justification by faith offers one salvation to everyone. Offers one salvation to everyone. Now, Paul moves quickly here onto the second implication. Unity and salvation for all people. The Jews relied on their possession and their performance of the law as their hope for salvation. So they believed that because we had the law and because we're working to obey the law, therefore we are okay with, with God. Now Paul has destroyed that line of thinking, destroyed that argument over the last several chapters. But, but he still needs to help the Jews see the impact of justification by faith. Look at verses 29 and, 20 and 30. He asked two questions. Or... Is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, of the Gentiles also, since God is one who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through faith. God is not a tribal God. He is not a God of a certain territory. He is the God of all. He justifies Jews and Gentiles in the same way way. Those who have the law and those who don't have the law, those who have been circumcised, those who have not been circumcised, are both saved through faith in Christ. There is no distinction. All have sinned and all fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption of Jesus Christ our Lord. God saves everyone the same way. So what does that mean for us? How should that affect our daily lives? Well, number one, first, all can be saved. All can be saved. If you're here and you're a non-Christian, can I just say thank you for being here? I know it's sometimes awkward and, and, and maybe difficult to come to a church gathering. If you may not fully believe them, we pray that you'd be, you'd be welcomed uh, here. Uh, I, I want you to know this morning that you can be saved the same way every other Christian has been saved in this gathering. By repenting of your sins, and trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. It does not matter how many sins you have committed in your life. It does not matter how terrible those sins may have been. If you turn to Christ by faith, you will be justified. You will be declared not guilty of every single one of your sins. Friend, God sent Jesus to be born as a baby to save us from our sin. He lived and died so all could be forgiven. He, he was raised from the dead to give us hope for eternal life. Friend, turn to Jesus and be justified by faith. And if you want to know more, any one of our members would be happy to have that conversation with you. Friends, I'm not sure if you remember just a few Wednesdays ago, um, there wasn't a lot of prayer requests, so I just said, church, let's, let's just pray for those in our life that we want to see, to see saved. And uh, usually when we do a popcorn prayer on Wednesday night, usually it, ma it happens about two or three minutes and then no one else wants to pray and we kind of ends it. But that prayer time just wouldn't stop. Mothers and fathers, husbands and wives, children and grandchildren, we were just pleading that God would have mercy to save. You need to know this morning that God can save anyone. Anyone. As I look around, I, I know the people in your life who are not walking with Christ. I know those in your life who have drifted far from God, and I know the pain it has caused you. But you need to hear me this morning that if God can save the uncircumcised through faith and the circumcised through faith, he can save whoever is in your life that you are pleading for God in your heart by faith in him. The second thing we see here is that all Christians should share their faith. We see this as a connection. The justification by faith should empower us in our evangelism. Salvation of others does not depend on you or your ability to communicate or answer every question exactly right. 
Your job is merely to share the story, and then God does the rest. Salvation is by faith. God gives that faith. We share the story, and God brings new life. And we should share the gospel with everyone. Why? Because he saves everyone through faith. So this Christmas, I pray that you would make it a point to talk to those people in your life about Jesus, that you would overcome the fear of what you think may happen and just say, Jesus loves you. Jesus died on the cross for your sins, was dead and buried, and rose on the third day. And I would plead with you to repent of your sins and trust in him. Or maybe just ask, have you thought about Jesus? Have you, can you, would you come to church with me to hear this gospel? God saves. The gospel is the power of salvation for all who believe. So what's holding us back from sharing this gospel? Three, all Christians share the faith. They share the same faith. Jews and Gentiles had the same faith in the first century. This would be mind-boggling for, for, for Jews to believe. So much of the New Testament is trying to explain to the believing Jews that the Jews and the Gentiles are on the same playing field. If it was true then, how much more is it true now? We have the same faith as First ARP down the street. We have the same faith as Eastside Baptist Church two blocks up the road. The doctrine of justification by faith unites us. The most significant things about Park Baptist Church are not the things that make us different from other churches, but the things that make all true churches of Jesus Christ the same. Justification by faith. The same gospel is preached. The same gospel is sung. The same word is read and heard. The same ordinances happen. God is not divided, and therefore the people of God should not be divided. Number four. All Christians then should work for harmony with one another. All Christians then should work for harmony with one another. You know, Paul is helping the Romans see how justification by faith should impact how they relate to other people in the body of Christ. Now, now we don't know this directly from the text of Scripture, so anytime that it's not directly in the text, you want to make a, be a little bit more careful. But most scholars think because of the, the, how, the, how the Jews were kicked out of, of Rome, Around, around 49 uh, A.D. by Claudius, and then came back, so they came back to Rome, we see this, 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 this problem emerging, in, we can see this problem emerging in, in Rome. Jewish believers and Gentile believers trying to live together as, as one. The doctrine of justification should, of, by faith should impact our relationship with other Christians as it impacted the relationship of Jews and Gentiles believing in the first century. Has the doctrine of justification by faith impacted your relationship with people who are not exactly like you? We all have the same salvation. We, have, we all have no cause for boasting in ourselves. We should all be humble and rejoice with what we share with one another. We share Christ. We have this foundation of Christ together. And if we have the foundation of Christ together, it should be able to be built upon to build deeper relationships. You know, Charles Spurgeon said, Satan hates Christian fellowship. It is his policy to keep Christians apart. Anything which can divide saints from one another, he delights in. Now we can't, I should say, we can focus on all that divides us, but we should focus on all that unites us. God is one and justifies all of us the same way. There is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all, in all, and through all. Justification by faith should change our life by changing our relationships with one another. You know, this year, um, I've had lots of conversations about friendship, lots of conversations with people in this body who, who feel like they lack friendship that they lack deep connection with one another. You know, my prayer for our congregation in in the coming year is that we would grow in deeper connection with one another, that we would understand, okay, we all have Christ. So let us lean in to people who may look different than us, act different than us, maybe different ages. Let's let's develop a deeper relationship. Let's cause our, our relationship with one another to grow and to flourish. I pray that as we dwell more and more on the justification by faith in the coming months, that it would free us to be more courageous to serve others and ask others to serve us. And I pray 
that as we understand justification, we'd be empowered to grow in our sanctification, sanctification and serving each other. Well, the third implication we see in the passage, justification by faith establishes the law for everyone, for everyone. So it excludes human boasting, that it unites us all in the gospel of salvation, and it establishes the law for everyone. Uh, Paul ends this section with one last question and answer, giving us his final implication of the justification by faith. Verse 31. Do we then overthrow the law by this faith? By no means. On the contrary, we uphold the law. Again, Paul will unpack this idea more in depth in, later in Romans, specifically in chapter 6 and 7. But here he just kind of establishes the principle. Do we overthrow the law by this faith? Or do we nullify or make to nothing the law by our faith? And Paul emphatically says, by no means. So if you're reading your Bible, and your English Bibles are a good translation, it says, by no means, exclamation point. That's kind of like him yelling at you, right? So you should, when you're reading the Bible by yourself, you shouldn't be going, by no means. By no means, right? There's this exclamation point there, okay? We uphold the law, Paul says. Paul will make the case in the next chapter how the Old Testament does not teach that the law of works, but that teaches the law of faith. Abraham was justified not by works, but by faith. David was justified not by works, but by faith. A right understanding of the Old Testament shows how, to, how it speaks of justification through faith in the promise and not through the keeping of the law. The Jews, the, the Pharisees in particular, who, who had, these, the, had the Old Testament did not understand what the Old Testament actually was pointing to. The law was always meant to expose our sin through the law that comes, or through the law comes knowledge of sin. The law points to the fact that no human being will be justified through their obedience to the law, but only through the righteousness of Christ because of his work. Jesus said this in the Sermon on the Mount. We just finished this on a Wednesday night. He said in Matthew chapter 5, Do not think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. The iota and the dot were the smallest markings in the in the Hebrew Bible. He says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. The righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was a self-righteousness. It was a righteousness where they were boasting in their outward works. And they're saying, look at all that I'm doing for the Lord, which makes me right with God. And Jesus says, if you have that kind of righteousness, if you are boasting in your works, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Do you understand why a passage like this is so important for us? This is why it's so important for you to ask yourself, are you boasting in your works for salvation, or are you boasting in the finished work of Christ? That's a, a crucial distinction for us all. Because Jesus Christ came to fulfill the law. He perfectly obeyed every aspect of it. So when he died, he was able to take the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. Galatians chapter 3, verses 13 and 14. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who is hanged on a tree, so that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promised spirit through faith. Jesus Christ purchased us from the curse of the law through his own blood. We are now free from condemnation and free to live in righteousness by the power of the spirit. He fulfilled the law, Jesus Christ, so now we can uphold the law through faith. When we believe in Christ, we are justified by faith. And the perfect obedience to the law of Jesus Christ is implied to us. So when we believe by faith, 
we now uphold the law. We now have kept the law in God's eyes because we have the record of Jesus Christ given to us. We uphold the law through faith in Christ. But when Paul says we uphold the law, he's also pointing. He's pointing to how Christians should fulfill the law in practice. Just a few chapters over in Romans chapter 8. Sneak preview, right? Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Turn there. He just teaches on this idea of, of being slaves to righteousness and this battle between uh, sin and, and the law. And then he says this in verse, chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. In order that the righteousness, the rights requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So Christians, hear me, are justified by faith. And that faith will cause them to walk not according to the flesh, but in the power of the Spirit. Uh, Calvin notes this, and often, often associated to Luther. It says, It is therefore faith alone which justifies. And the faith which justifies is not alone. Just as it is the heat alone of the sun which warms the earth. And yet the sun is not alone because it is constantly conjoined with light. A justifying faith will be accompanied by a justifying life. Justification by faith does not stifle our obedience to God's moral standards, but actually empowers our obedience. The one who uses justification by faith to justify their sins is not justified at all. Let me say that again. The one who uses justification by faith to justify their sins is not justified at all. And I'm not just saying, those of you who may have heard that come from someone's mouth, that I can do these things because I know I'm forgiven by God. I'm talking to you who are actually participating in wickedness where, which you don't want anyone to know about. And you're saying in your heart, I know that God will forgive me from this. I know that I can do these things because I'm justified by faith. If you think that you can engage in, in wickedness in private and God doesn't see it and you will be justified by God on the last day, you are sorely mistaken. If you are justified by faith, your life will be changed. Now, that doesn't mean that you're not going to struggle with sin and fall into sin. Don't get me wrong. You know, you we're justified by faith alone. You're not saved by your works. But if you are truly saved, you will work. You will work to please the Lord Jesus. You will work to obey his commands. Christians strive to uphold the law because they want to walk as Christ walked. Galatians 5, 13 and 14. For you are called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. That's really what Paul is addressing here in Romans Chapter, chapter 3, right? Just in, in seed form. He'll, he'll flush it out in, in, in Romans 6. Those who, who say, listen, I, I, I am now free to, to, to live any which way I want because I'm justified by faith. All I have to do is buy, I'm saved by faith. It doesn't matter what I do. Therefore, I can go sinning and do whatever I want. Paul's like, no, no, no. He says, we do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love, serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So are you applying our justification by faith in fulfilling the law of Christ? Have you crucified your passions and desires by faith? Or are you using your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh? Listen, we do serve others. We do love others. We do labor to obey the Lord's commands. But we do not labor in the same way under the law. 
We do not labor to earn favor with God or to obtain our salvation. We do not labor to boast about how we are able to obey the law. We do not labor for ourselves, but we labor in response for what God has done for us in Christ. We labor in the fruit of the Spirit. We labor in joy for the joy of Jesus Christ. So listen, friends, justification by faith should change our lives. It should eliminate our pride and it should grow us in humility. It, does, it should drive us to share the gospel with all. It should unite us with all Christians since we have a common salvation through faith. And it should challenge us to obey the law out of love for Christ. And it should cause us to rejoice in Jesus. We cannot obey our way to Christ. We cannot serve our way to salvation. We are sinners and no human being is justified by the law. And this is why Christ came. He left heaven for us. He left glory for for shame. This is what happens when when you, when you think of the incarnation, you, want, you need to think about Jesus Christ at the right hand of God. You need to think about him eternally in, in, in the presence of God. And all the glory in which he was surrounded by, he left to come down to us. Augustine of Hippo writes these words to help us meditate on this. Help, help our hearts think about what Christ has exchanged for us. The word of the Father by whom all time was created was made flesh and born in time for us. He, without whose divine permission no day completes its course, wished to have one day set aside for his human birth. The maker of man became man, that he, the ruler of the stars, might be nourished at his mother's breast, that he, the bread, might hunger, that he, the fountain, might thirst, that he, the light might sleep, that he the way might be wearied by the journey, by he the truth might be accused by false witnesses, that he the judge of the living and the dead might be brought to trial by a mortal judge, that he justice might be condemned by the unjust, that he discipline might be scourged with whips, that he the cornerstone might be rejected upon a cross, that he courage might be weakened, that he the healer might be wounded, that he life might die. To endure these for us, to free us unworthy creatures. He did this although he who submitted to such great evils for our sake had done no evil. And although we who were the recipients of so much good at his hands had done nothing to merit these benefits. Beloved, Jesus Christ came to us unworthy creatures to fulfill the law so we could be freed from it. He died so we could live. He was raised so we could be justified. Beloved, it is natural for us to boast about things, to promote things that have impacted and changed our lives. But what will you really spend your time boasting about? The doctrine of justification by faith should slam the door on our boasting and silence our feeble attempts to speak of our human accomplishments. And yet it should cause our mouths to to open wide and boast in Christ and in Christ alone. For he is Lord and there is no other. So this Christmas season, the coming year, what are you going to boast about? I pray that you, you boast that you have been justified by faith through the Lord Jesus Christ. For what you boast about reveals what you really believe has changed your life. So I pray that which has truly changed your life is that you have been justified by faith. Father, I do pray that those gathered here today would understand even more of what justification by faith truly means. I pray, God, that you and your kindness would help them, would help me see how we are cracking the door, leaving subtle ways to allow us to boast in our own accomplishments and our own works. We pray, God, that from this passage, that you would help us slam the door on human boasting and help us rejoice even more that we are justified by faith through the redemption of Jesus Christ in him and in him alone. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.